Okay, good morning everyone. Today we are continuing with our book clubs on the fundamentals of diagnostic radiology. Uh, on the, uh, today we are talking about the chapter 22, the cardiac imaging in acquired diseases with your colleague, Dr. Ali Hussain. He may proceed. Good morning everyone. We start with the coronary artery diseases. Now first, the topics, first topic is coronary artery calcification. Coronary calcification is detected in angiography in 75% of patients with 50% diameter stenosis. In symptomatic patients, coronary calcification is seen in 50% of patients with single vessel <coughs> disease and an increase with two vessel disease and three vessel disease. So uh, as more vessels involved, there will be more calcification that can be seen. Overall, fluoroscopy detection occurs about 70% sensitivity and specificity, while exercise tolerance that has sensitivity of 76 to 88. So uh, without the numbers, the exercise tolerance tends uh, maybe have sensitivity more than the fluoroscopy, but it's less specific than the fluoroscopy. The use of electron beam CT and multidisciplinary CT has improved the sensitivity for coronary Multi, multi detector CT has improved the sensitivity for detecting coronary artery calcification to about 95%, and it has a negative predictive uh, value of, z of zero calcification is 94 to 100%. So, when there is no calcification can be uh, seen, we can be sure yani, nearly 100% that there is no calcification. Uh, uh, in the previous session, uh, our colleague talked about the coronary calcium scoring, the gut response, uh, just as we, uh, if there's a the score from 0 to, to 10, it's minimal, mild, uh, it's minimal or uh, very low, from 10 to 100, mild uh, calcification, from 100 to 400, it's moderate or high, over 400, it's uh, considered very high. And here in this picture, this is uh, it show. It shows this calcification of the left uh, left coronary artery, left main coronary artery, and the left uh, and anterior descending, and also the diagonal. About myocardial perfusion scanning, the hallmark for segmental ischemia is a perfusion perfusion defect on stress testing that's felt in during rest examination. So this is during the rest examination. There is filling of all of the of it, while here there is a filling defect during uh, stress. Stress echocardiography using either exercise or pharmacological stress modalities has also become widely accepted method to detect significant coronary artery stenosis. The sensitivity for these tests uh, also increases as more and uh, more vessels are diseased. Gated blood pulse antigraphy will demonstrate exercise induced wall motion abnormality in 63% with significant coronary artery disease. With exercise, the ejection fraction normally increased by at least 50%. Failure of by 5%. Failure of injection fraction to increase with exercise is an indication of myocardial dysfunction. Coronary angiograms and CT angiograms, patients are divided into one vessel, two vessel, three disease on the basis of involvement or of right or left main coronary artery, left descending artery, and left circumference artery. The right coronary artery is 10 centimeter long, the left main coronary is one centimeter long, the left anterior descending is 10 cm long, and the left circumflex is six cm. Totally, they measure 27 milli centimeter. These are divided into 54 5 millimeter segments. If we add 5, it's 270 millimeter. When you have to uh, to report to report it, you have to mention the percentage of the stenosis and the number of 5 millimeter segments involved. And how much 5 millimeter segments involved? One, two, three, four. How much? Uh, this picture, the, uh, this is CT coronary angiogram. Uh, there's a stent here, and distal to it, it show calcification, and the <coughs> flow is patent inside this segment. MRI. MRI can be used to to detect location and size of previous myocardial infarction, uh, to uh, 
uh, differentiate complication of uh, to demonstrate the complications of previous infarction uh, to to differentiate presence of my viable myocardium for possible revascularization uh, for detecting acute versus chronic myocardial infarction regional myocardial wall motion systolic wall thickening myocardial function ejection of fraction papillary muscle valvular abnormalities and to evaluate regional myocardial perfusion this is MRI and here this is during diastole and during systole we see that this is the normally contracted normally contracted wall and there's in the inferiorly there is reduced contractility or thickening of the wall this is indicate my previous myocardial infarction Myocardial infarction. After acute infarction, the chest radiograph will initially show a normal heart size in 90% of cases. Cardiomegaly and congestive heart failure will eventually develop in majority of them, now 70%. More frequently, with anterior wall infarction, multivessel diseases, uh, or left ventricular aneurysm. So, cardiomegaly and congestive heart failure will uh, develop more frequently in anterior wall infarction rather than inferior. Now, some of the complications of myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock typically associated with acute pulmonary edema, arterioventicular block is common, especially after inferior wall infarcts. Right ventricular infarction occurs in approximately 33% of inferior wall infarction. Myocardial rupture uh, has a mortality rate approaching 100%. Rupture of the interventricular septum occur in about 1%, usually as a complication of anterior myocardial infarction and left anterior descending. Papillary muscle rupture is occurring in 1% is suggested by abrupt onset of mitral regurgitation with acute pulmonary edema or radiograph. Typically, the left ventricle is only minimally enlarged, whereas the left atrium enlarged quickly. Just, just I want to repeat it that Cardiomegaly and congestive heart failure occur more frequently in anterior wall infarction than inferior. IV block occur more commonly with inferior infarction. Right ventricular infarction occur more frequently with inferior wall infarction, while myocardial while rupture of the interventricular symptoms occur as a complete of anterior myocardial infarction and left anterior descending artery disease. Ventricular aneurysm, true aneurysms are broad-mouthed, uh, localized outpushing that don't contract during systole. They are typically anterior or apical and result from left anterior descending disease. The chest radiograph shows a localized bulge along the left cardiac border and may show rim-like calcification in the wall. While oppositely, the pseudoaneurysm are contained myocardial ruptures consisting of a localized hematoma surrounded by adherent pericardium. Pseudoaneurysms are typically posterior lateral or retrocardiac in location and have small, smaller mouths than true aneurysm. Regarding infarct imaging, electron beam CT and a multi detector CD with contrast will demonstrate poor perfusion of infarct segment immediately after administration of contrast. After a delay of 10 to 15 minutes, the normal myocardium washouts while leaving a contrast enhanced periphery of infarct zone. So this, the, uh, the sign of the infarction is the uh, contrast enhanced periphery at, at the delayed image. Regarding MRI, MRI will demonstrate prolongation of T1 and T2 times secondary to edema of the acutely infarcted segment. Edema occurs within one hour after infarct. The infarcted area is best delineated by high signal on T2 weighted image. T1 weighted image with gadolinium demonstrate the acutely ischemic region and will help to differentiate reperfusion from occlusive myocardial infarction. The regional wall thinning and lack of systolic thickening are good evidence of the size of the infarcted segment. Scar tissue will not contract whereas viable myocardium will contract and thicken by at least 2 mm. And this is MRI uh, image contrast enhanced uh, 
in this uh, this area of a bright enhancement in the lateral wall and this indicate a infarction Contrast here is medium, yes. But in the stress state, it will be some peripheral enhancement because of certain enhancement. But in the stress energy, the muscular stress energy increases heart rate. Heart rate, high heart rate is bad for energy. And the other topic, uh, cardiomyopathies, are a group of anomalies with the three basic features. Failure of the heart to maintain its architecture, failure of the heart to maintain its normal electrical activity, and failure of the heart to maintain cardiac output. We have four types of it, the dilated hypertrophic restrictive and UHL anomaly. From the name, the dilated types, there's, there will be left ventricular thinning, and also the cavity of the vent left ventricle will be dilated. So as with this dilatation and thinning, there will be decreased contractility. And the hypertrophic show left ventricular thickening, but the ventricular cavity will be normal or decreased because of this thickening. So contractility is increased, while the compliance of it, the diastolic feeling, will be uh, decreased. The restrictive one is show normal ventricular wall, normal cavity, and normal or decreased contractility, but the compliance and diastolic feeling is severely decreased. Where the UH anomaly, this is involved the right ventricle, which will become thin and the right ventricle dilated, like the dilated type, but it involves the right ventricle. Dilated cardiomyopathy, it accounts for 90% of all cardiomyopathies. It has many causes, ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, acute uh, myocarditis, usually caused by virus, coxagivirus toxins, like drugs like doxorubicin, uh, metabolic uh, causes, nutritional deficiency, in infants of diabetic mothers, and muscular dystrophies. Larger heart sizes are associated with worse prognosis. And this is a chest X-ray of a dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a short, uh, enlarged cardiac shadow with a water bottle configuration, uh, and the azygous vein here is dilated, and the pulmonary uh, pulmonary infiltrate also a result of the pulmonary edema and capillary leak. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may be familiar in 60% of cases with autosomal dominant or may be associated with neurofibromatosis or Nonan syndrome or secondary to pressure overload like systemic hypertension. It's divided into two basic types, constrict hypertrophy which may be diffuse, concentric which may be diffuse, midventricular or apical in distribution. And the other type is involved the symptoms called asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, also known as idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis. On chest radiography, 50% of patients will have normal chest radiograph, and 30% will have left arterial enlargement commonly because of the mitral regurgitation. And this is MRI picture. Uh, this is during a diastole and this is during systole now uh, we see that there is uh, the septum is markedly thickened in comparing to this uh, in the wall of the ventricle is normally they are comparable restricted myopathy is least frequent form of cardiomyopathy etiologies include infiltrative disorders such as amyloid Restrictive cardiomyopathy should be considered when patient, patients present with symptoms of congestive heart failure without radiological evidence of cardiomegaly or ventricular hypertrophy. The primary differential diagnosis is constrictive pericardial disease, and the CT can differentiate uh, of them. This is a case of uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. We know this is the right arterium dilated, the interventricular uh, is also dilated, abnormal high sig uh, IVC is also dilated, abnormal high signals uh, within the myocardium, uh, and also the uh, septum has abnormal contour. This is a case of the amyloid restrictive cardiomyopathy. 
Right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Scored pulmonary is defined as right ventricular failure secondary to pulmonary parenchymal or pulmonary arterial disease. It may be considered a secondary form of right ventricular cardiomyopathy. The chest radiograph show a normal sized heart, mild cardiomegaly, or even a small heart. Right ventricular and right arterial enlargement may be present. <coughs> the main and central pulmonary arteries are prominent and the periphery is oligemic. The interlobar artery typically measures more than 16 million. The, lung sh the lungs show signs of their pulmonary diseases, obstructive uh, airway diseases, or emphysema or fibrosis. UHL anomaly, this is the UHL, is the name who is discovered, the first described the disease, is the name of it. I don't know how to read it. I searched on the internet, really, I didn't find it. <laughs> oh, Yul? Yul? This rare form of cardiomyopathy is limited to the right ventricle with dilatation of the right ventricular jumper with marked thinning of the anterior right ventricular wall and abnormal right ventricular wall motion. As we said, it's like the dilated one, but it involves the right ventricle. MRI shows fatty infiltration of the anterior right ventricular free wall as is considered diagnostic for this disease. Pulmonary vascular diseases. The first topic, enlargement of the pulmonary outflow tract is seen in congenital heart diseases with left to the right shunts because of the increased the pressure in the right side of the heart that will be reflected in the pulmonary outflow also. Outflow tracts prominence without evidence of a shunt lesion is usually the result of post-stenotic dilatation. This stenotic may be due to pulmonary valvular diseases or a pulmonary arterial hypertension Marfa syndrome or uh, idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery. Idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery demonstrate dilated main pulmonary artery with normal peripheral pulmonary arteries and normal balanced circulation between the two sides of the chest and it, uh, between the two lungs. And it's more common in, in females, idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery is more common in females. Uh, uh, the, the other topic is pulmonary arterial hypertension should be considered whenever the main pulmonary artery and left and right pulmonary artery are enlarged. Classification within the pulmonary artery was are virtually diagnostic of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is uh, the picture of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The main pulmonary artery here it's, it's enlarged, it's cursing above the left uh, left main bronchus, so this is the side of it, and there's calcification is seen in the right pulmonary uh, artery, and this is the, uh, and this is also the left pulmonary artery also enlarged. So all the features mentioned here are present in this x-ray. The other topic about uh, pulmonary vascular diseases, asymmetric pulmonary blood flow. Pulmonary valvular stenosis often result in increased blood flow to the left lung with resultant left pulmonary artery dilatation. Tetralogy of fallot co may cause an increased blood flow to the right lung. Pulmonary venous hypertension. Progressive civilization is accompanied by progressive secondary enlargement of the pulmonary arteries and filling out of the hilar angles. In uh, yes. It's more perfusion yes. than the right. Both of them are decreased. There's preferential flow go to the left. Yes, yes. No, no, dear, I'm not going to do that. So, preferential, but really they are on the right side of the right. Because this is considered, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the left lung, and the right is here. The blood would take this direction, the direct one. Pulmonary venous hypertension. In pulmonary venous hypertension, there will be progressive cephalization. Uh, and progressive secondary enlargement of the pulmonary arteries and filling out of the hilar angles. 
The most common cause of pulmonary venous hypertension is elevation of the left arterial pressure secondary to left ventricular failure. The next topic in this session about acquired valvular heart diseases. First one is mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis in the adult is usually caused by rheumatic heart disease and is more common in a male by ratio 8 to 1. Lattenbaker syndrome is a combination of mitral stenosis with pre-existing ASD resulting in marked right-sided enlargement. Because both of them, the ASD will cause uh, uh, shunting from the left to the right side and by itself the mitral stenosis uh, results in the increased depression in the left atrium, so more blood will go to the right side, so there will be more right-sided enlargement. The normal mitral valve surface area is 4 to 6 square centimeter. Mite stenosis uh, is considered when the uh, surface area is less than 1.5 cm, moderate when it's less than 1 square centimeter, and severe when it's less than uh, half square centimeter. The chest radiograph is often characteristic with a long straight left heart border, left arterial enlargement, prominence of the left arterial appendage, and cephalization of the blood flow indicating pulmonary venous hypertension. So the first three are clear because of the increased the pressure in the left atrium. Then after this increased pressure in the left atrium will be reflected on the pulmonary veins and will cause uh, congestion of the lungs and cephalization of the blood of the blood. Then pulmonary arterial hypertension after that will develop left arterial calcification, mitral valve calcification and prominent pulmonary artery and eventually right ventricular enlargement and dilatation of the IVC may also occur. Mitral regurgitation. Today, mitral regurgitation is most commonly secondary to mitral valve prolapse, but may also caused by ischemia-related papillary muscle dysfunction or infarct with papillary muscle rupture. The radiograph shows left arterial enlargement that's greater than that seen with the pure mitral stenosis. So the left arterial enlargement in the regurgitation is more than that in mitral stenosis. Left ventricular enlargement will also may present. Pulmonary venous hypertension is less prominent than in mitral stenosis. So the left arterial enlargement is more than in the stenosis, while the venous hypertension is less than that in mitral stenosis. The radiograph is near normal with mild mitral regurgitation. Show arterial enlargement and pulmonary venous hypertension with moderate disease and show progressive left arterial enlargement and left ventricular enlargement with the more advanced regurgitation. MRI using gradient echo and gated sign mode show the regurgitant jet projecting from the left ventricle on the left arterium <coughs> during systole. Grade 1 when the turbulent flow extends to one third. Uh, back to the left uh, atrium, grade two wins uh, two thirds of to the left uh, atrium, and grade three wins uh, more than two thirds of the of the uh, back wall of the atrium. Yes, in the side one. Mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse is seen in two to six percentage of the general population and is more common in young women. It has an autosomal dominant transmission and is more common in patients with straight backs, pictus excavatum, and narrow anterior posterior diameters of the chest. The chest radiograph is usually normal, although occasionally patients will develop mitral regurgitation, left arterial enlargement, or pulmonary venous hypertension. Aortic stenosis is caused by partial fusion of the commissures between the tricuspid aortic valve cusps. Alternatively, a bicuspid aortic valve is found in 1 to 2 percentage of the population and is present in 95 percentage of congenital aortic stenosis. So it will, will cause by two things. Either the aortic valve is normally tricuspid and the stenosis occurs due to fusion of these commissures, or the aortic valve by itself is by cusp and this is found in one to two percentage 95 percentage of those present with congenital aortic stenosis they are by cusp so if we see a children with aortic stenosis we suspect that this is a by cusp aortic valve but in adults we suspected that this is maybe uh, due to a pro process of calcification and atherosclerosis changes that lead to a fusion of these between these commissures 
by cast aortic valve is most common in male and is present in 25 to 50 percentage of patients with aortic correctation. The aortic valve area is normally 2.5 to 3.5 square centimeters. Symptoms typically occur when the valve area is less than 0.7 square centimeter. However, if it's less than one, one and a half square centimeter and there's combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, we can find uh, symptoms may develop. This is a chest X-ray uh, of aortic stenosis. It shows enlarged, this is enlarged ascending aorta. It's highly suggestive of post dilatation and this patient aortic stenosis. And uh, dilatation of uh, ascending aorta should not be seen in patients younger than 40 years. And this is MRI. Uh, this is show signal void in the whole ascending aorta. This is indicating turbulent high blood flow due to the stenosis. Aortic insufficiency or regurgitation. Chest radiograph show a dilated calcific aortic root with a normal heart size and mild disease with moderate disease. The left ventricle and cardiac ciliary enlarged with severe disease, left arterial enlargement and congestive heart failure develop. Supravalvular aortic stenosis is the result of a localized hourglass type narrowing above the valve. Subvalvular subaortic stenosis may be fixed anatomical defect or a dynamic functional obstruction. Fixed subaortic stenosis is associated with congenital heart disease, especially VSD in 50% of cases. Pulmonic stenosis pulmonary valve stenosis is seen in 80 yes sorry is seen in 80 percentage of congenital heart disease and is uncommon as an acquired disease the chest radiograph often shows dilatation of the main and left pulmonary artery with an increased flow into the left lung left lung right ventricular hypertrophy and enlargement in adults may be seen Rarely, calcification may be identified in pulmonic valve. Bacterial endocarditis, few notes, intravenous drug abusers are particularly at risk of tricuspid valve involvement. Tricuspid valve involvement is suspected when multiple septic pulmonary emboli are seen on chest radiography. Valve vegetations can be detected in 50 to 90 percentage of patients with known bacterial endocarditis. And it is difficult to, dis to discern uh, whether these vegetations are acute or chronic. The next topic about the cardiac masses. Cardiac masses include thrombi, primary benign, primary malignant, and metastatic diseases. Chest radiography is typically not useful uh, because most of the, these masses will not uh, dis disturb the contour of the half. They are from the inside, except for occasional calcific masses. Thrombi are the most frequent causes, and they are most common in the left atrium and the left ventricle, than the right side. Arterial thrombi commonly occur among the posterior wall of the left atrium. Left ventricular thrombi are usually secondary to recent infarction or aneurysm. The differentiation of a tumor versus a clot is best done with MRI using graded e uh, echo techniques. The thrombi will show uh, a low signal while the, uh, the mass will show intermediate signal. The thrombi don't uh, enhance while the uh, tumor will enhance. Regarding benign tumors, arterial myxoma makes up 50% of primary cardiac tumors. So they are arterial myxoma make 50% of all cardiac tumor, whether benign or malignant. And it's the most common primary benign tumor. And is present in the middle age, uh, middle age uh, population. And they are frequently calcified. And mostly occur, we said uh, they may occur in the left atrium or left ventricle, but mostly they are occur in the left atrium. Uh, the other one is intracardiac lipomas or lipomatous hypertrophy are readily identified on multi-detector CT. MRI is also useful and will demonstrate characteristic bright signal on T1 and remain relatively bright on T2. And fat saturation sequences will help us to make the specific diagnosis. 
other benign tumors include fibromas, uh, rhabdomyomas, and triteratoma. Rhabdomyomas are found in 50 to 85 percentage of tuberous sclerosis patients. I, I didn't understand this percentage. Yani a patient with uh, tuberous sclerosis, 50 percentage of them will have rhabdomyomas? Yes. Because they will have angiomyolipomas with the kidney. They have rhabdomyomas in the heart. So things to look for when you diagnose cases of tuberous sclerosis. You look for lamp, if it is a female, for angiomyomatosis in the lung. You look for rhabdomyoma in the heart. You look for angiolipoma. Oh, uh, it's talking about the heart, maybe. 50% up to 85% of the wrestlers will have a problem in the heart. Or in the central giant cell neurocytoma, and it passes to the foreign tumors. Regarding malignant tumors, metastatic tumors are the most common malignant cardiac tumor and about are 10 to 20 times more frequent than primary cardiac tumors. I think a primary, this is not mentioned, but I think this should be primary malignant cardiac tumors. Malignant yes. Cardiac. Yes. Uh, they are most frequently, uh, the primary source would be breast, lung, melanoma, or lymphoma. And MRI is excellent tool. Angiosarcoma is a, the most common primary malignant cardiac tumor and followed by other sarcomas, like rhabdosarcoma, lycosarcoma. And this is some picture, this is a show here are thrombi in the, uh, near the apex. And here there's also, this is a left arterial thrombus, as filling defect. Yes, left arterial appendage. And by echocardiography, this is a thrombi. And this is a left ventricular aneurysm with filling defect inside it. This is a thrombi inside it. And this is a big zoma, MRI in the left arterium. And this is a, and this is a mass lesion in the left ventricle. Uh, and the patient has tuberous sclerosis, so the uh, diagnosis made as rhabdomyoma. Just the advice, when you do an abdomen ultrasound for any patient, when you start at the midline or the left or the pancreas, so just angle the probe superiorly, tick, very quick look on the heart. Sometimes you won't find things in the heart, masses, thrombi, and things with pericardial things like that. Uh, you, more than you expect, yeah, you will find things. It's not bad to just yeah. record them and come and decompose. And this is another case of cardiac mass, right arterial myxoma. And this is uh, MRI, this is showing metastasis to the heart. Pericardial disease, uh, pericardial effusion is the most common abnormality of the pericardium. Pericardial strip is two to three millimeter on chest X-ray and CT and less than four millimeter on MRI. So the pericardial strip is thicker on the MRI. The water bottle configuration is seen in chronic effusions. 20, 200 mils are detectable by plain film, while echocardiography can detect 50 mil of pericardial fluid. MRI can characterize the fluid uh, uh, by the T1 weighted images. If the, if the fluid is serous clear, it will be uh, it will uh, uh, be dark on the T1, while if it's uh, contain hemorrhagic or infected, it will appear as uh, brighter signal on T1, weighted image. Cardiac tamponades refer to cardiac chamber compression by pericardial effusion under tension, compressing the diastolic filling. The chest radiograph will show rapid enlargement of the cardiac cerebrum and relatively normal appearing vascularity. Con constrictive pericardial disease is the result of fibrous or carcific thickening of the pericardium, which chronically compresses the ventricular filling through the restriction of the cardiac motion. Calcification is seen in radiography in 50% of patients. Pleural effusion and ascites are common. Chest radiography will show normal to mildly enlarged cardiac cellule with small arterium, dilated superior inferior vena cava, zygous vena, flat or straight, right heart border. Small effusion may be seen with effusive constrictive pericarditis. 
CT is particularly good at demonstrating precardial thickening with 3 mm and more and precardial calcifications. Yes. Yes. And this is a case of constrictive pericarditis with sure pericardial calcification. So. The last topic, uh, pericardial cysts are most common in the cardiophrenic angles and more common in the right side than the left side. The cysts are attached to the parietal pericardium ranging in size from 3 to 8 cm. They are occasionally communicate with the pericardial space. They are cyst attenua uh, CT attenuation numbers are typically uh, 4 to 40 and don't significantly increase with contrast enhancements because they are cysts. MRI will demonstrate characteristic low signal of a fluid on T1 with no internal enhancement and bright signal on T2 weighted image. The differential diagnosis of cardiophrenic angle mass include pericardial cyst, fat pad, lipoma, enlarged lymph nodes, diaphragmatic hernia, and ventricular aneurysm. And this is a case of the uh, pericardial cyst in CT. And there's another topic. Congenital abscess of the pericardium is a uh, male to female ratio by 3 to 1. The age of diagnosis in could be from the infancy to old age. A complete left side, complete left side absence is the most common uh, uh, type of it. Uh, with complete absence, the heart is shifted toward the left side with a prominent bulge of the right ventricular outflow tract, main pulmonary artery, and left arterial appendage. Insinuation of the link into anterior posterior into anterior posterior window and beneath the heart is characteristic. Goes into the meningeal. Sure. This is the considered partial absence of the pericardium. You see the lung goes below the heart because there is no, no pericardium to. Attached to the diaphragm. Okay. And thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Very nice. It's a difficult subject. You focused on the main ideas.